Well, thank you all. Um, Mr. Walker, it's nice to see you, of course. Um, and, and as far as questions go, just, you know, very informal, wait in uh, at any point if there's something that I say or there's something up there on the screen that you, uh, you, you, you do have a question on, please feel free. Um, not done this uh, before, uh, this particular talk. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, see. we'll see how it goes. So civil war deaths and casualties, uh, why, how, what, why would you be interested in this? Well, I, I just found through the years that um, battles, leaders, you know, the basics sort of of the Civil War, uh, you know, uh, you've, you've read everything you can, not everything you can read, of course, but you've read a number of books. And, uh, and this is just for some reason has always attracted me. And um, I love, I love the, the cemeteries. Uh, where, where are these folks? Uh, what's the, you know, the family connection, you know, and, and the number of folks that we can't account for, uh, that are buried out there somewhere. And, um, I think you can, you don't have to go any further than the battlefield at wilderness and, uh, and, and you can, you can walk through there and, um, um, the, 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 the possibilities, uh, just sort of jump out at you. Um, and this is just a sort of the, the, the numbers keep changing, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, why is that? Should we care? And then why Chancellorsville? And that's a number, there's a number of reasons why I ended up um, pursuing Chancellorsville, not the least of which is that it was the um, uh, Second Corps, Confederate Second Corps Hospital uh, was at Elwood Manor and, and a volunteer there for, oh, 12 or 13 years until the park decided that they weren't going to use volunteers there any longer. And so now we're, uh, the Friends of the Wilderness have moved on to Mine Run and we're affiliated with the American Battlefield Trust and we are interpreting the, uh, the Payne's Farm property. So if you haven't been out there in a while, you need to come out and visit with us. We'll be out there this summer. All right, let's see here. So the, um, keep in mind when we talk about deaths and we talk about casualties, we're talking about two different things. When we talk about the number of deaths, we're, we're, we're also including in that number, of, or that number, that overall number, about two thirds of that number is made up of folks uh, uh, with disease, that died from disease. They're not combat related. So when we talk about casualties, we're really talking about four different categories. And you'll often see the, the reporting broken down into, into these four categories. Killed in action, um, what I call uh, W, uh, wounded, um, uh, bless you, and um, um Wounded, wounded in action who are going to pass. Um, I've seen, you know, uh, the next day, I've seen months, okay, that it might take, depending on the severity of the, of the injury. And, and, uh, and then you, you get into, um, and we won't uh, get into that discussion today, but you get into, well, what, did they die of disease or did they die of their wound? Did Stonewall Jackson die because he was shot and had his army amputated, or did he die of pneumonia? Um, would would he have died of pneumonia anyway? Um, I, I, we could we could argue that um, as long as you wanted to, but um, it it is um, in my view. I if what I really the way I really approached this was what I'm what I'm looking for here is what's the impact on the army going into the next battle? So where are we going after Chancellorsville? We're going to Gettysburg, okay? And when you look at the Confederate Army that moves, you know, out of Virginia and and up to um, to Gettysburg, it's a very different army than the army that uh, you know that Lee put in the field at Chancellorsville, and that was because largely because of the 
tremendous losses that he suffered and the impact that it had on the leadership uh, in particular and, and just the, the general overall numbers um, uh, taken, taken together. Another category, uh, well, on the wounded side, um, sometimes your lists are very good and very complete and they'll list um, arm, uh, arm amputated. I've seen it, I've seen left leg blown off you know, uh, and then there are other times it just says wounded. So sometimes you get a little, a little more information. Sometimes you get a little less, but that's, that's going to be the second category. The third category is prisoner of war. I think we all sort of have an idea of what we're talking about there. Um, early in the war, they were exchanged. The prisoners were often exchanged later in the war. That policy is going to change and the Union Army is not going to uh, exchange. And um, that, like I say, as we, as, as we move through and we get later on in the war, there's less and less of that. Um, and then there's the category of missing, which is um, sort of wide open in, in my view. You can be talking about deserters, um, or you can be talking about stragglers. There's always sort of an element, I think, in every military organization that when the battle is about to occur, there's a certain number of folks that just seem to disappear. And, and then, you know, when the battle's over, they'll oftentimes reappear and tell everyone what a great fight they had. And they did this and they did that. And everybody knows that, no, you weren't even there. You know, you were somewhere. You were behind a tree or wherever, <laughs> wherever you're going to get to. But there's some interesting, there's some interesting um, um, uh, books or, or sections of books that talk about stragglers. And, and oftentimes these fellows, it just seems like they needed rest and recuperation. They just needed to get away from the military grind. Um, now, we're not talking about, you know, in the, in the heat of the battle, but they would disappear for a week or 10 days or two weeks and then just sort of come back and seem to be, you know, back to normal again. Small numbers, but, um, and sometimes just to be able to sneak into maybe a church uh, and sleep for the night and, and rather than, you know, be out in the rain and, and in a tent and, and so on. Um, and then oftentimes you'll see these, uh, these um, folks will be uh, ID'd as POWs. They're not picked up as POWs right away. But the numbers are, in other words, they're going to write this report oftentimes probably seven to eight to 10 days after the battle. It, it, uh, that's what seems to be mo in uh, most of the ones that I have seen. And so those numbers will change. And, and, and then at the end there, the uh, NFR, it's the dreaded no further record. And you'll see that frequently. And Sure enough, you know, you'll go to, well, you know, I'll, I'll always think, well, if I go to fold three, I'll find, I'll find something. And you go to fold three and yeah, this guy was at Chancellorsville, um, no further record. So did he die? Did he desert? You know, we'll, we'll keep, you know, we'll keep his name out there and we'll keep looking, but he's just, at this point, he is truly missing. So that would be sort of the, the definition. Shortly after the war, the number of deaths was placed at a total uh, number of 539,689. And that was published up through sort of the, the late um, 1900s. Um, and then early in the 20th century, there was a study undertaken. The government went back and looked at pension records. And of course, these are going to be largely the, on the union side. And they upped that number um, by almost 100,000 to 618, 222. Now, I've seen, of course, I've seen other figures, but in that ballpark of 618,000. And I think that's the number that probably when we were coming up through the, in the books, your, 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 um, you know, your history books and so on, that's roughly the number that you would see. And that was pretty much the case up until um, 2011. And J. David 
heart, a hacker published um, some new figures. And basically what hacker did is he took the census numbers for 1850, 1860, 1870, and 1880, and he came up with a series of formulas um, uh, based on the numbers of white males that were um, in that census. And he came, he actually, his numbers came up to be, I think his range was 680 to 820. And the average was about 750,000. And most historians basically accepted that. Everybody felt like the old number was low. And this at least kind of made sense in the way he, he went about coming up with this new number. Um, the thing there uh, to keep in mind is that that's really not based on, you know, individual folks, um, at which you'll see is when I work, worked through the Chancellorsville numbers, you know, when I came up with my number 23% higher than anything that I had seen before, that's based on, you know, 23 23% more names. In other words, a body. I could put a name with it to get that number higher. It wasn't based on, um, you know, a formula that, that uh, based on overall numbers of the census. Does anybody, anybody, I, I've not read um, Hacker's work. I, ju I just, um, um, you know, I just know that he's, it's sort of accepted at this point. I don't know whether anybody else has uh, done any work with it or not and looked at it. Okay, so those are, those are the overall numbers. So, so why, um, why did I take a look at Chancellorsville? Um, I think we were all, you know, generally familiar. Um, certainly one of the most significant battles. Um, you know, 200,000 troops were engaged. Um, one in six were wounded and killed, which is, a, which is a pretty high number. One in 10 is a little more like it usually. Um, Chancellorsville uh, gave Lee, I, I, I think Lee had already made up his mind he was going somewhere. He was, he was gonna invade the North again. Um, but um, then, then when Hooker crossed and, and came over and created the situation at, uh, at Chancellorsville, it just kind of put a little crimp in his, uh, you know, in his plans, but uh, nothing that was gonna, uh, in other words, when it was over, he was, he was still ready to, to, uh, to move and get back to his plan. Um, the key date for us at, uh, as the research that we did at, at, um, at Elwood Manor, uh, was on the 8th of May, we know that the Confederate Army was going to go back into camp after the Battle of Chancellorsville. And when they moved all of the wounded, and this was basically, uh, the, the process would have been to put the wounded on ambulances, you know, reed wagon with springs, uh, and they're going to move them over to the railroad at uh, Guinea Station. And then from there, they would be uh, moved back to Richmond. And that was the, that was the typical uh, approach uh, in, in most of the, the battles in this general area. The wilderness is a little different because you're going to utilize, you're going to utilize Gordonsville uh, quite a bit more, um, which I learned from Ray uh, when he talked about the cemetery out here. Um, so on the 8th of May, uh, the, the, uh, the medical staff at uh, Elwood Manor and at the, the uh, Wilderness Tavern, Second Corps, informed the leadership that they had 132 soldiers there that were too severely wounded to be moved. And their solution was, we'll take Elwood Manor, who was, which was part of that overall complex, we'll make Elwood a convalescent hospital, and we'll leave those 132 soldiers there. And that's what they did, because it, was a, it made perfect sense uh, Elwood Manor had a kitchen, had a laundry, um, had a nice house. Um, it, you know, it, it just, it just made good sense, uh, sort of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the, the man they put in charge was, uh, named, uh, John Graham Alexander. And, um, we'll, um, we'll take a, take a look at him here in a second. Um, so somewhere along the line, 
probably 10 years ago, uh, one of the reenactors uh, who came out to Elwood uh, on a frequent basis, three or four times a year, his name was John Pelletier. And John portrayed a Confederate surgeon and uh, he, he just stopped me one day and he said, Bob, you know, sort of put his finger in my chest and he said, you guys really need to tell the story of, of Elwood as a convalescent hospital. And, and he said, it's, 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 cr it's a crime that there's nothing in this building that indicates that Elwood was, was a, and I truly believe that it's the only example, Confederate example of a convalescent hospital that you can find today. Um, that, you know, that we have, that's documented and that we have, we have, uh, you know, records on. Um, John, unfortunately, passed away a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago and uh, was a close friend and three of us went down and spent a little time with him when he was, uh, um, you know, he had been diagnosed and uh, talked to his wife and she told us she thought he would enjoy the company and uh, he presented us with his uh, with his surgeon's case, uh, which uh, which I have, and um, you know, will always be a a prized possession. But uh, anyway, so John John's the guy that if I could name the room uh, out there, I would call it the you know the John Pelletier Memorial, um, you know, convalescent hospital or whatever. Uh, Park Service um, doesn't doesn't view it that way. Yeah. So what we did is we um, and and I'm and and this is a little bit off the track, but I thought you might find this kind of interesting. Um, we had no idea what we were going to do. We had a room, a very small room, that was the only place we could we could we could do this. Uh, and um, so uh, three of us, uh, Bob Epp and John Canister and myself, um, we made road trips to, um, started at Seminary Ridge in, uh, the hospital there in Gettysburg. Uh, we did the, um, uh, uh, um, Civil War Medical, uh, Museum in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, if you haven't been to these spots, you, you really, you, you really want to go. The folks at, uh, the folks in Gettysburg were just incredible. Uh, they sat and talked to us for you know, for hours on, on end, because again, we didn't have a background. None of us were really medical people and we weren't sure exactly what we wanted to do. We didn't even know if we were going to have figures or not. But as we looked at other exhibits uh, in, in those, at those facilities, it became apparent to us that, that yeah, this is, this is probably what we wanted to do. And, and we, we said, well, the guys at, at, um, you know, at Gettysburg, we said, so what did you pay for one figure? And they had phenomenal layout there, obviously got tons of money. Um, and we said, they said, oh, this is the same outfit that makes all the the uh, figures for the Sports Hall of Fame museums and uh, $10,000 a piece. And of course, you know, we were kind of like, uh, yeah, we got about 15000 total that we were we were hoping to spend. So, um, so we came back and we relayed that and we worked in, in all of this with John Hennessy. And I think a lot of you probably know John, but he was the chief historian at the time at the park. And so we, we had to run everything through the park. And John said, well, John's wife was the curator at the Fredericksburg museum, downtown Fredericksburg. And, um, she had just bought a figure from an outfit in Baltimore, Maryland called Dorfman's and uh, he said, really good. And, and she got it at, our, at a very reasonable price. So we got online and we, we always, uh, anywhere we were going, we, we always had to have a barbecue restaurant somewhere in the area. And so we found one in Baltimore and we said, okay, we're going to Baltimore. So we made a road trip up and talked to the guys at Dorfman's. And um, the way they do this is they, um, you sit down in front of a computer and we had a picture, all right, let's see if I can do this. We had a picture of, this is Adam Wilson um, from Blacksburg, Virginia, 4th Virginia uh, Regiment. His, uh, he was shot in the, uh, just above the elbow in his right arm. His arm was amputated. And uh, we, we had a, 
he was one of the 132. We have, we we're only still looking for 131 now, uh, because we, because we know who, uh, who Adam was. And then this is Dr. Graham. He was the chief surgeon. And when you see pictures of these guys, we, we did find pictures. We didn't have a picture of Adam. And I'll tell you that one story quickly here in a second. But uh, when we, when we did come up with pictures, we were able to take the pictures to Dorfman's and they'll sit down with you and they've got like, maybe 150 heads, okay? So, uh, you know, you can eliminate the women, you can eliminate African-Americans and so on, and Native Americans. And so you get it down to maybe four or five, you know, reasonable head shapes. Some people are a little longer, some people a little rounder, you know. And, uh, and, and then we had to make a decision on the beards. And because we didn't know that they had beards, we knew they had beards when their photo was taken after the war, but we figured maybe they didn't have beards and we went back and forth. And of course, when you're talking five, six, 800 bucks a pop, that enters into the picture too, because that's how much a beard's gonna cost you. Um, so anyway, we decided what the heck, you know, we're, we're gonna go uh, full bore here. So we, we, um, we did uh, uh, go ahead and decide to put beards on the two individuals. But um, we were uh, very happy. Uh, unfortunately, the other two guys over here, we don't know anything about them. We have no idea. You know, we just uh, stole that view from the um, medical museum in Frederick, Maryland. They had a very similar scene and, uh, and we, uh, we liked it. And so, you know, you, we took it. That's it. No need, to, no need to reinvent the wheel, I always say. You know, if you see it, you like it, and, and it works for you, then, uh, and nobody's ever said, oh, you know what, I think you guys took that idea from, uh, so, so anyway. Um, real quick, I, I said we'd come back to Adam for just a second. Um, uh, we know, you know, we know where he enlisted, and uh, we know that his, his arm was amputated by a surgeon named Harvey Black, and Harvey Black kept a, 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 a log of letters. He wrote his wife almost daily, and those were published, uh, you know, after the war. And he mentions in here because the, uh, uh, he, the Black family obviously knew the Wilson family because he tells his wife, you know, tell Mr. Wilson that Adam, you know, I amputated Adam's arm. He's at Elwood doing fine. And, um, so we knew there, there was a connection there. And uh, from later information from the family, let's see what I can do this. We know that um, his arm was, uh, he, you know, he was moved from down at the tavern on the 8th, moved up to Elwood as part of, the, the, uh, uh, of that uh, kabuki dance. And then uh, or somewhere around the 23rd, I think he says in, his, in, in a newspaper article, that he checked himself out of the hospital after a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, that was that was our uh, rough guess. Um, I, I'm well. We don't need to go into that. I, a, a lot of these folks who were le lost a leg, even or an arm or whatever, uh, ended up in the invalid corps, and they were still part of the army. And they could like guard a railroad or, you know, participate in some form or fashion. Adam did not do that. And we don't know, um, you know, he wasn't around to ask. So Adam, we lose track of him for about 15 years. And the next time he shows up, he's in Lewisburg, West Virginia, selling agricultural gates door to door. So I get this mental image of a, of a one-armed guy driving a buckboard around you know, schlepping gates up to people's doors and knocking on the door. And he comes up to the, to the Tuckweiler house and Sarah, the young daughter comes to the door and he says, you know, I'm here selling agricultural gates. I'd like to speak to your father. She says, I'll go get him for you. And she immediately goes to her mother and tells her that she just met the man she's going to marry. So, uh, and she did. And, uh, so at that time, the house, uh, which is obviously still there in Lewisburg and is uh, actually occupied by his granddaughter. And uh, I'll tell you 
real quick about that here in a second. But um, uh, it was a stagecoach inn at the time, and the main road that ran through Lewisburg passed right in front of the house. You can see the road trace very clearly. And so uh, I mentioned Bob Epp before. Bob's sort of our master genealogist. And, um, and um, he called me late one night. We both are night owls doing research and uh, because we have no other life. And uh, he said, uh, I just found Adam's uh, granddaughter. And I said, I said, he's got to be his great granddaughter. He said, granddaughter. And I was like, oops, sorry, didn't mean to, you know, step into your your garden there, but you're the you're the genealogist. And so now when you stop and think about it, <clears throat> obviously Adam, who is is uh at the time, he's already sort of 40-ish. Well, he they have about eight kids. So he's probably in his early 50s when his last son is born, and he names his last son Harvey Black Wilson after the doctor that amputated his arm. He always felt like Dr. Black had saved his life. So Harvey Black Wilson, you know, uh, gets a late start, and he is sort of like you know, his dad, he doesn't get married until he's very late in life. And his last child is the daughter, the granddaughter, who now owns the property. She and her husband. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, I, I call them late bloomers. I, I've got a son that, you know, he's, he'll be educating his last one until he's, uh, you know, drawing Social Security. Um, this is his, uh, this is the granddaughter. And, uh, so I went, I was, um, uh, on my way, I called her, I told Bob, I said, he said, I, I have a phone number. And I said, well, you know, is it all right? If you think it's all right if I call her? And he said, sure. So I just called her up one night and introduced myself. And I said, you know, we're just a bunch of crazy guys out here, uh, researching your, your grandfather. And she said, oh, I've got his musket. You know, I've got all kind of pictures. I got all kind of papers, and I said, "Well, uh, around Thanksgiving, I'll be coming through Lewisburg to Charleston to uh, visit in-laws. Would would you uh, mind if I stopped and talked to you?" And she said, "Oh no, we'd love to have you." So, um, so I stopped and visited, and then I got a call from her, and she said, "We're on our way through your neck of the woods, going to Maryland for a for a wedding." Would it be all right if we stopped and visited? And uh, at that point, Adam was looked like this. He was living in my basement. And uh, if you can see, there's there's a uh, when we pick those up, there's they've got a set of uh, glass, you know, plastic like goggles that were attached to their heads. And and I said, oh, is that to protect his eyeballs? And they said, no, it's to protect his eyelashes. That if you would happen to put your thumb or your finger and mash one, you know you're never going to get them back, you know, as perfect as they, uh, you know, as they had them. Yeah, we we once we got the head shaped, then we sat down with trays of eyeballs and picked out, you know, the eyes and all the rest of the uh, uh, the accoutrements to go with it. So, so anyway, um, that's Adam. That's uh, and and my sense is if if I could find him. Uh, then I've just got 131 more names to go, and we'll have we'll have found all of the um, you know the patients that were that were at Elwood. Now some of those folks obviously didn't survive, and we know there were burials of some of those folks on the property that were later moved. All those bodies were exhumed and moved down to the Confederate Cemetery in uh, downtown uh, Fredericksburg. But um, again, we're We've just been a little bit derailed because of the situation where we're now no longer at Elwood, but um, but our work in that in that regard will continue. So, where did we start? We'll we'll call this the rest of the story. Um, well, an introduction. You're talking about Elwood being a convalescent hospital. And of course, here locally, 
we know that the Exchange Hotel in Gordonsville was a receiving hospital. Correct. Could you sort of go through the hierarchy of hospitals? Yeah. Uh, kind of quickly. Well, well you, you had. had uh, uh, we talk about uh, um, some of the takeaways. Adaptability was one of them. Um, so ideally, wounded soldiers would be moved from an aid station, which would be just behind the firing line, just, just far enough away to where you didn't get those straight bullets coming through. And then from the aid station, they would be moved to a field hospital. And that's what we would call uh, the wilderness tavern area would be the second core and that would qualify as a field hospital. And then uh, amputations could, would occur right there. They would do triage. They would decide who was most seriously wounded. Do we need to, in Adam's case, do we need to remove that arm? Do we need to remove that leg? And of course, we've got some correspondence from, um, from Elwood um, when the decision on those 132 were made and Dr. Lafayette Guild, who was, the, who was the head surgeon, is writing back to Samuel Moore, the head of Confederate medicine in Richmond, and he describes the, uh, the large uh, portion of the injuries were um, upper thigh amputations. So you can understand why those folks were so, you know, would, were, would be immobile and very difficult to move. Um, uh, they called it uh, uh, a three-chord system, and then your general hospitals would be, and the goal would be to get that individual eventually back to the general hospital, which would be in Richmond. So uh, uh, Gordonsville, I think, would fit into that sort of same category as sort of a field hospital or a, or a receiving hospital, and then from there they're moved and transferred because they were on the railroad. That, was, the, of course, was the key thing, just like Guinea Station. So they're on the railroad to get them back to Richmond. And, and, and all of the trains that came into Richmond came into General Receiving Hospital Number 9. And that, that's because it just, it was, I think it was a tobacco warehouse originally, but it happened to be a key, on a key spot where the, all the railroads came together. And then from there, there were over 50 hospitals, Confederate hospitals in Richmond. Um, now, uh, uh, the two biggest ones, Winder and Chimborazo, are the ones you hear most about. But there were a lot of smaller hospitals, you know, in fact, some private homes maybe only had three or four, particularly for officers. Um, uh, that, 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 you know, where, that's how that number ballooned up to, you know, to sort of 50. And they, and they would close and open and close. Uh, you know, when, when there's a big battle, you, you know, you're, you're obviously going to get a huge influx. Then things will die down, quiet down over the winter. There's not much fighting, and some of those may close over the winter, and then they open up again. So, are there are there any of those hospitals in Richmond that are still open? The buildings are still there. Yeah, um, uh, they have most of them just what, have like a plaque on the building. Um, there are a couple of books that have that have been written about that. Um, I'm trying to think, one of them was I know it was written by a lady, and she goes she went through all like 50 of the hospitals and tell them exactly where they were within the city and then the ones that still survive and then but most of them of course are are gone. Chimborazo, the property is still there. The National Park has their their headquarters in Richmond on that property, but that's not that's the hospital's long gone. That's that's a different building that they've occupied is, as is, part of that. Is Captain Sally Tompkins Hospital still there? I don't think so. Um, Sally Tompkins uh, was a lady who used to come out and with John uh, Pelletier, and I can't think of her name right now, who portrayed, she was the, a reenactor who portrayed uh, Sally Tompkins. And the interesting thing, the more fascinated I became and read about her, is she had phenomenal numbers at her hospital. She had this, uh, like, the highest survival rate uh, of any of the hospitals. And the Confederates, at some point, uh, somebody made a stink about her. Um, they, they were closing a lot of smaller hospitals, and she said, oh, you're not going to close my hospital, and she had a lot of support. And so Jefferson Davis apparently made her, uh, said, well, we'll get around that, and that's how she became a captain and put her in the military. 
Uh, but what I also have come to find out is that she was very particular about who she accepted as a patient. <laughs> and that was one reason that her numbers looked so good. So, but yeah, she's, you often, you'll always hear her name mentioned when you talk about the hospitals mm -hmm. down there, Captain Sally Tompkins. Yeah, there's a window to her in St. James Church. Oh, okay. I'll have to mention that to uh, Marilyn Iglesias is her name, is the lady's name that portrays uh, Sally Tompkins. Okay, any other questions about, is that, does that jive, Frank, with? Yeah, yeah, yeah I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, there, there will be no tours, there are no tours given at Elwood any longer. There's, there, there'll be a ranger there, and there are some volunteers there, but they're not necessarily, some of them still belong to the Friends, but uh, some of them are just volunteers in the park that, um, you know, that, that volunteer there. But uh, they'll greet a, 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 you know, a visitor and tell them they're welcome to wander through the house, and if they have any questions, they'd be happy to answer them, but, they're, but they, don't, they don't give a formal tour. Uh, I can't imagine someone coming, going to Montpelier or, or Monticello and, and you know, just being told, well, just wander around and then you can ask us a question. No, no does it leadership. Yeah. Well, it happened during the, the pandemic, but not since then. Yeah. So are the dummies still at Elwood? Or no? They are. <laughs> the dummies. That's a little, that's a little tricky and I, and that, I won't, I, I shouldn't get say, it, up again. I shouldn't say it keeps me up at night. <laughs> But, um, but, but we own those. I mean, we paid, that, that hospital room was about $18,000 when it was all said and done. And, um, and so my concern is that they are cared for because we remove them from the room every year. We had mice problems. Mm -hmm. And I went in one time and there was a nice big hole eaten in a shirt. And um, so, uh, you know, there are concerns about, um, because again, you know, Elwood Manor, you can't, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to mouse-proof that house. Um, it, it's just a park wall out. And, you know, the doors are original doors, and they're going to stay original doors, and you can sit there, and there's a gap like that, you know, underneath the door. Um, <coughs> that's never going to go away. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yes, the short answer is that the, the figures are still there, and the room is still there. You can walk down, you can look in it, and there are two interpretive panels that, that explain, you know, Adam Wilson and explain the, uh, the system that, that we were just talking about with Frank. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, like I say, it's, there's, there are no tours, so it's not part of the, of the overall. Uh... Okay, Chancellorsville. All right, so, so, we're, um, so we're, ready to, we're ready to start the, the research process for this. And when, when, when I decided I wanted to try to find all those 132 people that were patients, it, it, you know, it quickly became apparent that I, I, did, I needed a good overall list of, of, of uh, you know, all of the casualties associated with that uh, second core. If you, if you remember the Battle of Chancellorsville, you had fighting in the city of Fredericksburg, as, as often called Second Fredericksburg. You had fighting at Salem Church. Those casualties were never part of the Second Corps Hospital out at Wilderness Tavern. It was only the fighting further down on the battlefield, the Second Corps. And so we were only interested in, but it's hard to separate all that out. So we just decided, what the heck, we'll, we'll just come up with a with an overall casualty list and then we'll you know we'll eventually we'll figure out who the 130s odd people were that were you know that were at Elwood. So what we discovered and do me a favor, uh, Phil if you would, there's a stack of uh, handouts in the back there. If you could give everybody one of those. And I think we've got enough to let everybody have their own. I was thinking we might have to double up, but that's not the case. So, so what, what we've got here is um, um, the, first, the first document that we were able to, I went to, the, you know, went to John Hennessy at the park, and I said, all right, John, I need, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, for casualty figures for Chancellorsville, and, and John said, well, we had some volunteers way back when 
headed up by uh, Dominic Villarreal in 1996, and they put together a, a death roster for us. And if you if you've been to the Chancellorsville Visitor Center, there's um, there's a room and it's got all of the casualties, the names on the walls. It's just list after list after list. Well, that's what this that's what this list was was essentially put together for was to to compile that list. Um, I very quickly when I got a hold of the list and I was looking at the wall out there, I told John, I said, John, you got a small problem here because you got 84 Mississippians who were killed and you've only got one Mississippian painted on the wall in the room. And it was like, oops, I don't know how that happened, but so if you really want to pull their chain one day, go ahead and ask them what happened to the other 83 Mississippians that should be up on the wall. Um, so that, this was, and, and this, if you look at your, your, uh, your handout, I think the first three pages, or yeah, the first two or three, first three pages are, uh, that's from that study by, uh, by Dominic. And uh, you can see that it's, it, it, it takes in more than just the, the main four battlefields. He lists Brandy Station. Um, he lists Salem Church separately. Um, Mine Run, which I found very interesting, and I got that one because because now that we're interpreting out of Mine Run, we're gonna we're gonna do this same drill there. But but here's here's what we we got as a list. So that was the first page. You can see mine. It's you, well, you can see on there that it's uh, been written on a little bit. Um, but this was a complete list of Union and Confederates. Just in alpha order, it doesn't give you a unit. It doesn't give you much of anything else. So that was that was our starting point, and we we began to, to compile a database. And then I ran across, and I'm almost reluctant to try to get this to come up, but we ran across it's the the U.S. archives, U.S. <laughs> U.S. W archives. U.S. government wartime archives, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a very basic. If you go to that, if you click on your website, it'll come up, and it, and and you'll see Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi, you know, Confederate states, um, and it's and it's a better database, but it's not. Um, it's not it's not everything that you would want, but it but it's 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 like a step up, and at the time that's really all we had to work with. And then there's um, trying to remember the order of these now. <laughs> I think that then then you got two pages out of out of my um, out of our list, I should say, and. Uh, And so this is the Bible, as I call it. And those two pages are taken from, these are, these are all the Confederate states. And so your first page there, I think that you have, it's, you've got the two pages facing. And the only point I wanted to make there is once we started this process, it's kind of like, well, you know, we've got the information about where they enlisted and when they were born, and so why wouldn't we include all of that in here in, in, as part of this data? So, so here's, you know, 3rd Alabama, 5th Alabama, and so on, you can see. Um, and this goes all the way through for all of the states, Georgia, you know, Louisiana, etc., South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and then we'll we can talk about some overall numbers here in just a minute. But um, but that's what those those two pages are taken from um, our sort of our master list. And then here in the last couple of years, this the second database on here is called the American Civil War Research Database, and. I think I gave you the uh, I gave you the overall front page of that, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then I gave you one, uh, one additional page, which uh, <coughs> I don't have a complete set. Let me grab a, thank you. This, this database here, and I don't get a penny if you, if you decide to give them 25 bucks, uh, is phenomenal. Um, you can you can go in here. Um, American Civil War Research Database. It just comes up civilwardata.com, uh, and this would be your you know this would be your first page that that would come up in that database, and then you know you click on you click on members, and then your first page is going to give you all of the states. So we want to go to Virginia. So you just click on Virginia. And it's going to give you, uh, the next screen will give you a, um, a menu. You just type in, let's say, 4th. If we wanted to do the 4th Virginia, so we're going to type in 4th. And then there's a pull down for uh, cavalry, artillery, infantry, and so on. So we're going to go infantry. And then we'll click that button. And Viola, you know, here's... Here's this screen, and it's it, and you can you can see individual soldier, and it's going to give you uh, his company date he enlisted, um, if he was killed, the out date, or if he deserted, whatever. However, he got out of there. Um, for example, if you go down to Harvey Wilson, uh, he was killed at, at um, First Manassas. And if you go up to what three, four names above that, you can see our boy Adam, Adam Yehu, Adam J. Wilson, uh, who would be listed in here. And if you click on that name, okay, then the next screen is going to open up and it's going to give you a complete readout on him from the time he enlisted till he the time he went out of the army. It's and somebody went through the, if you're familiar with the Virginia Regimental series. And I've only in uh, I've only ever seen three of those. Um, one here, complete set. There's one in the Virginiana room downtown Fredericksburg in the library. And at the uh, Emerging Civil War tour last year, we had a tour of Charlie McDaniel's house. I don't know whether you know Charlie. I think he owns Hildreth Storage. And it's it's right downtown. It's called the Sentry Box. It's been there forever. And, and he has his own private gun collection and library. And when I went and walked into his library, he, has, he owns a complete set of the Virginia mm. Regimentals, which, needless to say, blew me away. But uh, anyway, and, and he is, he's, very, uh, he's a very generous individual as far as you know, donating to uh, a, lot of different, a lot of different charities. But he's, he's very much interested in the Civil War and, and is a big part of it big part of that but uh, anyway so if, if you're ever you know involved or want to do if you're looking for a family member you know you name it this is just to me is just completely amazing now some states like Virginia North Carolina are far better than let's say Louisiana Louisiana right now it only list it has a listing of names it, it doesn't break it down any further than that but they're continuing to work on this. It gets better and better and better as you go along. So, like I said, um, I wish I had, I wish it were there like 10 years ago instead of, you know, more recently, but I'll take, you know, whatever I can get. Um, the, the, for me, the Bible, well, besides the one that we have, uh, for the Battle of Chancellorsville, is uh, Stephen Sears' book. And the reason I like Stephen Sears' book is because when you go back here, and someone has a doodle all over my, my book, uh, you can see it, it lists a complete uh, breakout of all the, the casualties, you know, the killed, and so on. So that was my starting point. That's... If you take a look at those, uh, the two pages front and back in your, uh, in your handout, toward the, toward the back, 
I, when I first put this together and I got lazy, I started, um, you can see that I listed Sears for each, you know, for each unit. Fifth Alabama, third Alabama, for Sears, six, uh, there were 16 deaths. And then where there was, a, for the official record, where there was a number in the official record, I put that in. But there were so few for the official record, I should have just dropped that category out of there. And then the last column would be our number from FOWB. So you can see that for the third Alabama, Sears's book, which I consider to be you know, pretty complete and pretty thorough, he had 16 deaths. We have 26 names at this point for that one. So if you go through this, all the way through, just flip front and back, it'll take you through all of the states, through all of the units, and when you get to the very end, you'll see that in Sears' book, he listed 17,024 uh, deaths, and right now we sit at 2,268, which is a 23.9% increase. Uh, that we've been able to find. So, what, is, what does all that mean? Uh, I'll be honest and tell you that I don't know exactly what all that means. Um, hey, Bob, uh, question yes, sir. on your, um, your order of battle. Right. Is that uh, brigade and division in the, in the second the third column? Uh, Richmond's O'Neill Road. Yes, that's correct. Brigade Division. Right. Plan. Right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so that's that's what you have. I I I I was afraid this would be an eye chart, and in which it is, and so that's why I went ahead and uh, printed it off on. Uh, Printed off a of, you know at a higher level, but you can see that the difference the 1724 and the 2268 there. Um, so um, you know every every account you read of Chancellorsville, it's you know it's Lee's greatest victory. He divided his army twice, uh, you know so on and so forth. Um, however, uh, if you when we when I said at the very beginning, you know, what is what does this really mean, or or why do we care? I think when you step back and you look at the numbers, you know, from from a distance, from a bird's eye view, if you will, or a drone's view, um, that when you look at May the third, uh, basically it was it was from that point forward, um, it was a slow and inevitable march to the to to his army's destruction. Um, peaked in efficiency at Chancellorsville, but he, he was he was losing competent officers at an alarming rate, and unsustainable casualties, particularly in his officer corps. And the Confederates, you know, they started out at the disadvantage. You know, when you look at where did all where did the majority of the officers who graduated from West Point, you know, yeah. you know they stayed with the Union Army yeah. in, in in most cases. I believe that Lee was the only colonel in the state of Virginia that graduated from West Point that that uh, became a, went into the Confederate Army. Is that right, Fred? I've been told that there were only two okay. regular Army colonels who did not stay with the regular Army. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I they, think I they think they were far enough up they could see the big picture. Yeah. Like Sherman, because Sherman was teaching them head of a military academy down south. And he and could I, see the south. And I think a, no, a number of them had married uh, southern, you yeah. know, into southern families is uh, the reason a few of them stayed. They knew um, how it was going to end. Yeah. So if, again, going back to, to, uh, to Chancellorsville, um, uh, the Union, now remember this is, these are casualties, so we're back to our four categories. But, um, and, and there were more Union soldiers present at Chancellorsville, but, but Hooker uh, didn't, he, he had 50,000 reserves that he, didn't, he did not engage in that, in that uh, uh, conflict. So of the 83,000 he had engaged, he suffered about 13%. Uh, 
uh, Lee had 13, you know, had fewer casualties, but when you look at his, his um, effective numbers of 60,892, he lost, he suffered a, a, a loss of 22%. Um, you know, I mean, the math just, it's, it's, you can't, it just doesn't work that way. He lost five brigade commanders, three division commanders, and of course he lost one corps commander who was Stonewall Jackson, of course. Um, but the attrition in the lower ranks um, of 134 regiments, he lost 64 field grade officers um, and, and was forced to you know, completely reorganize um, his army into three elements, vice two, uh, before, uh, you know, before they went to, um, uh, to uh, before they, you know, they went up to Gettysburg. So they would never be as efficient you know, as they were before. And if you if you didn't you know if you didn't have those numbers if you didn't couldn't see that um, you know you might that might be a point that you know that you would miss and that's it. So well, well, um, when I took my graduate level military history classes in college in the early nineties, you know we were taught then that the 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 way the North, or the way the Civil War was fought, shifted from a war of maneuver early in the war, and then when Grant was installed as, as commander of the Army of the Potomac, then it shifted to war of attrition. Yep. And once it shifted to war of attrition, with the, with the outset of Grant's command, that's, that sounded the death knell of the, of the Confederate Army. Um, but what I see here is, even during the period that the, that the Confederate Army was still fighting that war of maneuver, the attrition rate still had a major, major impact on their ability to carry out future operations, even, mm -hmm. even well before Grant yeah. uh, came into the picture for, for, the, right. for the Army of the Potomac. They didn't have that. What do you what do you call it? You know the the the, the line the, the guys that were moving up, it, you know they're they're both going to suffer you know losses, and again keep in mind the Civil War even your generals they led from the front, you know that's why these colonels and these folks are you know they're they're out out they're out there you know they're they're putting themselves in harm's way that's the way you that's the way that you fought it back then, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, but they, but again, the Confederates just didn't have the depth, you know, to continue to bring new, fresh, and think of the experience. I mean, even a lieutenant, you know, who gets killed, okay, so the best maybe you can hope for is to bring um, maybe a senior NCO is going to step up into that position. You're going to commission him, but he doesn't have, you know, they don't have the experience you know, in that position as a lieutenant, um, that um, that that the union's going to be able to you know to to continue to fill their ranks with you know with with more experienced individuals uh, um, you know than the Confederacy. Um, I, I you know you, you and you, you always talk about oh you know the railroads and the and the you know the um, uh, steel production and you know all of those things that. You know, we know the North had a tremendous advantage of. I just don't think this probably gets as much play as it should. Mm. Um, yep. But following up on what Ray's talking about, in terms of maneuver, Lee took an entire army, and with the competent people that he had going into Chancellorsville, he was able to make that army dance. And there was never a commander anywhere, north or south, who ever did that but Lee. Yep. And, and you know, I, I think that that's part of that. I, I, you know, you, you wonder, like going to, to Gettysburg, that Pickett's Charge and those kind of things, that they, they, they had sort of gotten this air of invincibility that, you know, that, that Lee felt they could... You know the common soldier loved him, and they could do anything that he asked them to do. Yeah. Um, 
maybe ask them just a little bit too much and uh, you know yep. in that particular instance but uh, thank you Bob. they they said that the, the cheering at you know when they when it was obvious that the uh, you know the union army had give, ceded the field to them at chancellorsville the you know the and lee came riding down uh you know with the troops and the the cheering and you know that uh, that's you know it, you can't you can't measure that you know it's just uh you know it's just be amazing but when you back off and you look at those numbers and you you know and you go wow um, yeah it was a great victory but it was also a very costly victory mm -hmm. also bob uh, at chancellorsville was was archer's brigade the only tennessee uh, force that was that was involved there, or was Thomas Legion still around and engaged at Chancellorsville? It's not on your not on your casualty list, but I don't know the answer. Because I think I Thomas have. Legion was was in Fredericksburg in, in late 1861, but I I don't know if they stayed or or made their way back around with with the Army of Northern Virginia. Hmm. I don't know. I'm sorry, Tennessee? Yeah. Thomas Legion. Well, there were only three Tennessee regiments, according to what I have. Okay. The first, the seventh, and the fourteenth. And that was those were all Archer and Hill. All right. Would have been the, the um, all right, they, they may have been pulled back down into the Army of Tennessee by that time. But I'll uh, I'll take a look, yeah, and see. But but yeah, according to what I got, is it's uh, it was all Archer and Hill there. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we know what casualty figures General Lee was using himself to think about cancers, though? You know, I, I I don't really know the answer to that. Whether I would, you would assume that um, that they should have been put together by um, um, who did I who did I mention before the the uh, Surgeon General um, Moore? Well, uh, who would have been the man on the scene here? Oh, okay. uh, Lafayette Guild, right? So Guild would be the guy who was putting those together, and and I do know that at one point. Lee issued an order that he didn't want slightly wounded to be a category within the reporting. Um, and, and I'm not 100% sure why, why that was. I mean, he must have had a good reason for doing that. But, um, um, but um, did he, you would think he would have had to have passed. I don't know whether he had to sign off on those. I don't know the answer to that. But it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think I think all those were compiled by, um, you know, by the by the surgical staff that were responsible. Mm -hmm. And and what I also found is that in some cases, um, those reports, and it could have been you know just the war. It could have been that it could have been those reports got back to Richmond and they got lost in the fire because uh, in the, in the fires I guess I should say. But but a lot of the medical records what we've got were records that existed out with the hospitals, you know, that were away from the, from the downtown area or with the armies, you know, um, but, but they, you know, but they lost a lot of that, but, but, but those records are very incomplete. It, yeah, and I, I get, I get drawn off here, but, uh, it's just like when you look at the Virginia regimentals and, it, and I don't know, Frank, if we ever talked about this, but what I've, I've found out is those Virginia regimentals are, I, to be kind, I would say very uneven. <laughs> Some of them are phenomenal, and the detail, and, and, and it's obvious that they just put in t a tremendous amount of time, and others are very sparse, well, very sparse. Mr. Howard, if somebody would volunteer to write a regimental history, he rarely turned them down. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that somebody told me the closer they got to the deadline, you know, the more, more lax he was about what he, was, what he would take. Uh, as far as you know, the final drafts were concerned, but yeah, some of those are. Uh, I mean, it's it's a great resource, but um, you just wonder, you know, in some cases, 
the Fourth Virginia comes to mind for some reason that mm -hmm. uh, because it, because that's the one that Adam Wilson was in, and I did you know did a lot of work in there, and I just remember thinking, man, that was in the Stonewall Brigade. Yeah. yeah. So you still have 131 people to track down. Yeah, and and I I got started on that when we were still you know with the park, and unfortunately I I think I came up with a possible list of like 500 or something. But 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 I I did find out that what exists in in the, the National Archives is that I mentioned the Ninth Hospital, the receiving hospital in Richmond. Those records actually exist. They're, they've not been digitized, which is unfortunate, but they're there. And so that's on my you know my list. That at some point I, I would love to to be able to sit down and look because see we know they they moved all these folks out on the eighth of May. So if I can go and look at the receiving hospital, you know, list, and, and I can match those up, then I can take a lot of those folks off my list that I, I know went on to Richmond, and and that you know, and then and then if I got that list down to maybe a couple hundred or something, then I'd be a lot easier to go and look at individual, you know, individual records, because a number of those guys probably well, again, you don't know what the exact percentages are on the amputees. Um, but some of those guys are, are probably going to get to the point where they could go back and join units. But I, you know, I, I just you know you don't know until you until you get in there. But no, it's yeah, it's still a work, um, it's still a work in progress. And uh, even though the well, well I got to tell you, Bob, if you as far as those records are concerned, you have to deal with the Park Service. And a lot of the younger people coming into the park service are looking for five o'clock Friday and payday. And you'd be better off working for, on my run. Can you can you shut off your camera? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> we'll delete that. <laughs> no, they need to hear it. They seem to think we don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I know nope, that. somebody's going to call me on Monday now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That was that was that was the article that Phil put in there uh, what, oh, like yeah, a year I, and a half ago. I, I never did respond. They were so. they were unhappy with us. <laughs> they don't like to be called out, and 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 I you know our sense was we 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 just we just told it exactly like it happened, just like you know I said that that there, there were six items and. When we got down to the very last one, we said, if, if even if we just can hang around and just give tours, you know, we'll let everything else go. We won't have access to the building any longer, although we had keys and codes for 20 years. We had, at, at one point, they asked us, they didn't ask us, they told us, you need to go get a background check. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm a retired Department of Defense employee. I've had a background, you know, investigation and check all my life. Uh, no problem. Oh, you have to go out to the Shenandoah Valley uh, to, to make that happen. Okay, we'll do that. So you drive out on your own nickel, uh, your own time, and to get and you get get fingerprinted. And um, um, but none of that mattered at that point because again, it was a it was an entire new leadership team. And I will say that one of that one of those folks one of those folks has already moved on to a to a you know to a new job. And um, kind of like you know, as Frank was saying, that. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you see a, a potential in the future at any time a potential uh, reunification of Friends of the Wilderness Battlefield with I, Park I think, Service? I think there's a good chance. I, I, as I tell people, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'll be 80 in October, and and I, you know, this is kind of what I do at this point in life. Um, and, and so in some form or fashion, but we, we always say the door is always open as far as Friends of the Wilderness is concerned. We would love to sit down and talk about this, but until some policy change is coming you know, from, from them, I mean, right now there's just not much to talk about. Um, the last year that we were out there, I will say this, we had the we had that building open 120 days. Last year, Elwood was open for 60 days. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. Do so, so who did we write to? <laughs> um, I, I would say you just go ahead and write to Superintendent Rogers and uh, Lewis Rogers and uh, make your make your feelings known. About the governor. Who's well, mowing the lawn? I, I um, well, there, there are still. There, I think there are still three. Well, the interesting thing is, when, once we moved on, they suddenly found money to hire someone to uh, to run the ground crew. <laughs> We've been doing that on a volunteer basis for 20 years. And, uh, and, and at first, they came to me and said, "We, we need twenty thousand dollars a year to do that." And I said, "You're dreaming." And so um, they they suddenly, oh well, guess what? We found the money, and they and they hired uh, hired somebody in there to do that. But there's still, I think, three folks that, you know, I, I mean, it's 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 hard to let go for folks that like, you know, been doing this for so long, and and you you feel so emotionally attached to it that uh, you know to, to to just walk away from it, um, pretty difficult. Thank you, Bob. Uh,